I am out here sitting in my husband's office at 3 o'clock in the morning because I just watched one of Dr. Berry's videos and I wanted to talk to you guys about some stuff. I have been doing a carnivore diet for 66 days and I'm going to tell you why. I've got some notes here. Straight out the gate, chronic candida. Chronic candida is what made me decide to do a carnivore diet. I am extremely satisfied with the results I've received thus far. But I want to tell you a little bit about the symptoms that I had with chronic candida. Um, because I think a lot of people think female yeast infections when they hear that you have chronic candida. And it's not simply vaginal yeast infections, okay? As a matter of fact, um, I was so good at keeping my stuff in check that, that I rarely ever got the female type of yeast infection. I would get a little tingle. Let's just say that. I would get a little tingle and I would know that it was coming and I had my ways of warding it off. Limiting my sugar would keep it at bay. However, it would never keep it at bay for long and it would also rear its ugly head in other ways. So I have a list here of symptoms and I'm just going to run down them just so you'll understand. And some of these may or may not be related to the chronic candida. Sometimes it's hard to tell. And sometimes, and some of these symptoms, I'm, I'm quite certain are not related to it. But I wanna tell you about the symptoms that I had prior. Um, just for reference, I'm 48 years old. I've probably been technically overweight since my 20 year old was born. After him, I had about 10 pounds of extra weight that I couldn't lose and, uh, or that I didn't lose. And then with each consecutive child, which I have four, um, I would pretty much keep about 10 pounds. So at this point, and then, you know, we had a little ice cream action going on there. So um, at this point, well, when I started carnivore, I was probably about 50 pounds overweight. Um, and I have since lost 18 pounds. But here are my symptoms before carnivore. I had extreme fatigue for years. Um, what I would think would be, could be called chronic fatigue. Sleepy all the time, every day of my life, no matter what kind of sleep I got that night, um, midday, I was definitely going to be sleepy and I would have to take daily naps. Um, there were some times, some periods during my life when I took several naps during the day. Once during one of my pregnancies, I would actually get up, get the other children on the bus, go back upstairs, lay back down, sleep till three o'clock when they got off the bus, go out and get them bring them back in and then say, I'm going to go take a nap before dad gets home and take another two hour nap. So I was literally sleeping all day and I did that for months. Um, I was pregnant at the time, but it wasn't just that. I've been pregnant multiple times and it wasn't just that. You know, like I said, probably not due to the candida, but yeah, that was something I did. Um, daily headaches. I, well, I had a whole pill box of Monday, you know, Sunday through Saturday pills that I would take every day. And Tylenol was included in that. Every day I would take a thousand, at least a thousand milligrams of Tylenol with just in the morning with my, with my daily pills. Then later in the day, I would have another little container in my purse of extra Tylenol because I would usually take it more than once, but every day for sure once. And that went on for, you know, several years. GERD, awful GERD, awful, awful GERD. Um, I was actually on 40 milligrams of Nexium twice a day and still had symptoms. Now, typical dose for Nexium would be 20 milligrams once a day. Um, I had, just as a nurse, I had some knowledge about 
how these medications are actually given. And so I would just bump myself up 20 milligrams once a day, 20 milligrams twice a day. Oh, now we're going to go to 40 milligrams twice a day and still had symptoms. Um, I had developed a intolerance to wheat. That's another, that's a big symptom of my, I think it's of my candida, is I developed a lot of different intolerances to foods that I had been fine with my whole life. Um, I developed an intolerance to wheat where the main symptom from that would be coughing. Um, and I, and, and I would have post nasal drip really, really bad. So it was like, is the GERD causing the cough? Is the post nasal drip causing the cough? Is candida in like esophagitis causing the cough? Because I did have some of that, um, a couple times. It was really, it was hard to, to tell and no doctor could ever really help me. Um, now if I had, which they had wanted me to have an EGD, I'd already had one in the past and they wanted me to have another one, but I just never scheduled that. I didn't want to do it. And I knew that if I stopped eating the sugary foods, it would go away. But yet I was addicted and I would still tell myself oh, you can, just a little bit of sugar will be fine. An addicted brain will tell you whatever it, you, that you are addicted to is just fine. You can, you can do a little bit of it. You can have one donut, it'll be okay. You can't. It's, with me, I for one am all or nothing. Like either I'm eating all the sugar or no, no sugar at all. There's no in between. So literally what would happen with me, I would eat something with wheat in it and almost immediately I would have, it was like it, my stomach was just rejecting it. It wasn't like a little GERD. It was like almost immediately it just, I would have GERD just come back, you know, acid just come up. It was almost like a reaction to the food itself. So that the GERD and the coughing caused a constant lump in my throat. So I just always felt like I had something in my throat and it was, it was a miserable feeling. The post nasal drip also contributed to that significantly. Had constant post nasal drip. I had to use a neti pot. That was the only thing that gave me any relief at all other than not eating the sugar, which, you know, I was so all over the place with it. Um, that I couldn't just not eat the sugar because I would eat the sugar and then I would be right back on the same, in the same, I never completely quit. So I would have to use my neti pot. I used the neti pot so much that I actually invested in one of the um, electric, or not electric, but battery powered neti pots. Thing is wonderful, by the way. It is the only thing that would help my post nasal drip. If I'm ever thinking I'm going to get sick or have any symptoms of any sickness, you know, respiratory wise, I use that thing. And I have used it um, to ward off some sicknesses as well in my mind. I don't know if it actually worked or not, but I know I was exposed to some respiratory viruses and I just like ran home and used that neti pot and um I'm thinking it makes sense to me. I mean, I'm, I'm flushing that stuff out, right? Whether or not I would have gotten it, who knows? But I know that I was clearing out some of that, those virus particles, if they were in there, you know, because where do they sit? Right up in your nose, your sinuses, back of your throat, the same places that the neti pot is working on clearing. So anyway, um, constant coughing, I told you worse with any sugar intake. I would cough so bad at times at work that I would throw up. I would go in the bathroom and throw up. People would hear me coughing in the bathroom. They would come to the door and be like, Kim, are you okay? I couldn't even talk. I was coughing. I, I was just coughing, coughing, coughing. Um, I know some of that was due to yeast because I also developed thrush two or three times. 
Now, I don't know if you've seen in my other videos, I actually do have a bit of an immune deficiency and I can go into that real quick. Um, so I have low IgM, which the, these are your immunoglobulins, which are part of your immune response. Um, you have, well, I'll just tell you the ones I'm low in, okay? IgM is low. It's around 20, if that means anything to anybody. Um, my IgG was normal, but then once they did, they broke it down into the subclasses. My IgG subclass one is low, and I have something called um, mannose binding lectin deficiency. And it is actually on, um, when I took my 23andMe data and I plugged it into Genetic Genie, it is actually a hereditary thing. So, healthy adults that don't have an immune deficiency or diabetes or just have absolute crap diets, don't just go around getting chronic candida. They, they don't go around and get they don't get repeated yeast infections. Um, the yeast basically take over because my body is not able to, or my body in the past has not been able to um, put up a good enough response to fight them off. Now, it seems to do fine with most bacteria and viruses, but for some reason, the candida with me, I'm super, I'm very susceptible to it. And so that's just something that I've had to deal with my entire life. Now, it started probably, I was around 19 years old, maybe 20. Actually, I was probably 20. It started when I was around 20 years old. Um, it was after I had, I had been in the Air Force for a short time. It was just under a year developed a sacroiliac joint injury and was released from duty just it was a I have an honorable discharge for medical reasons so long story short under a year I came home after I came home um, I started to get I started to get yeast infections um, I had never had one before and they just started coming on now I will say that when I was in the Air Force I gained some weight I actually got I say I, I actually got fat during basic training I didn't get fat, but I gained about 10 or 15 pounds. And I remember after basic training, coming to the, going to a pool and putting a swimsuit on for the first time. And I felt for the first time in my life, I felt my inner thighs rubbing together when I'm walking. I was like, what the hell is that? <laughs> you know, I was 19 years old. I didn't, I'd never had that happen before. I was a little skinny thing my whole life. So not only did I gain a little bit of weight from what we were eating, from what the government feeds you, um, just basically a bunch of carbs and, you know, I mean, they had meat and stuff too, but it's all the standard American stuff. They had tons of pies and cakes and desserts and, you know, donuts and, uh, pancakes and just all the things and come to find out and doing my research online there are a lot of sufferers um, and a lot of them try to stick to this diet they call the candida diet I've never actually done that I'm the type of person that I actually do better with more restrictions I do better with keto I do better with any kind of low carb and carnivore. I've done very well with carnivore. And it's just, you know, I, I'm kind of an all or nothing type person and and I thrive with that. And and carnivore has just given me such an incredible boost of energy and just mental clarity. 
unbelievable. Okay, so with the constant coughing, often that cough would lead to bronchitis. And then how I discovered that I had the immune deficiency was I actually developed pneumonia three times within a four year period. Had never had pneumonia in my life prior to that. And I was like, something is wrong. You know, as, as a nurse, I realized that's not right. That's, I shouldn't be getting pneumonia twice, you know, but that would be a fluke. But three times that there was definitely something to it. So that led me to going to the immunologist and gave me a few answers, but Honestly, there's not, there are not a lot of doctors that have actually helped me, and I've didn't been to just about every kind of doctor that there is. <laughs> um, well, I can't. I mean, I've been to several. I've been to a. <clears throat> I've been to a lot of doctors um, with this, and the one that helped me the most was a functional medicine doctor, and she actually ran tons of tests and treated me for my chronic yeast. The yeast did go away um, temporarily, but then once I went back to even eating a moderately healthy-ish diet, it came right back. So ADHD, my ADHD symptoms that I've had since, I mean, I've had a lot of this since childhood but it was getting really, really bad. I've tried numerous stimulants and non-stimulant drugs. I can sleep through the stimulants. I could take Adderall and lay down and take a three hour nap. It does not affect me like that. However, it is a stimulant and it is addictive. And so I was concerned about getting off of Adderall, but I'm happy to report that I am now off of Adderall. And what helped more than anything, doing a sardine fat. Let me tell you, honey, those omega-3s, they, oh man, it, my brain was just like, I've never seen my brain like that before. <laughs> I didn't need the Adderall. I quit taking it for three days. And then after that, it, I went on vacation and I was just like, who needs Adderall on vacation? You know, I don't need to pay attention to any of this stuff. <laughs> but... Yeah, I could sleep through the stimulants, and I mean, with me being as fatigued as I always were, was, I had actually agreed to take the stimulants hoping that maybe that would help my wakefulness a little. It didn't, not at all. Um, joint aches, constant joint aches. My SI joint was the worst. My ankles off and on throughout the years had hurt so bad. I mean, there were times that my ankles would hurt so bad that I had trouble walking, you know, and the least amount of weight that I would gain, like even the most minimal amount of weight, like five, 10 pounds, it would change my ankle pain significantly. And I haven't had, knock on wood, I haven't had any ankle pain and I don't have any joint aches anymore. It's, it's amazing, y'all. The worst thing, I was getting a lot of these symptoms that I thought were kind of autoimmune in nature. And one of those, well, two of those, one of them was um, I had one joint in one finger that just swelled up and hurt all of a sudden. I didn't have an injury in it. I went and got an x-ray. X-ray was fine. And it just my doctor that's that's another reason why she sent me to the well she sent me to a rheumatologist at that point because she thought that I had psoriatic arthritis or possibly another autoimmune disease all of my markers for autoimmune diseases were normal and when I went to see the rheumatologist he basically this is at a university hospital so they see the worst of the worst so he basically looked at it and said, eh, you know, sent me on my way, you know. He, <laughs> he didn't do anything for me at all, really. He ordered an MRI of my SI joint. I didn't want to pursue that any further. It just seemed kind of pointless to me. And actually, 
I do still have a little bit of SI joint issue and I'll always have that because I have that you know old injury but it has definitely improved with the carnivore diet but uh, one of my worst symptoms it seemed autoimmune in nature was when I would get up in the morning you know you're freshly stepping out of the bed for the first time my the bottoms of my feet would hurt so bad they would just ache so bad it was like I had been walking you know if you walked in a mall for half a day the way that my feet felt on the bottom it was like that so when I would wake up in the morning I would feel like a zombie I would I would be so tired if I didn't matter if I got eight hours of sleep or not I would be so tired in the morning and I would just be like zombie like just almost like running into stuff and it was awful my tendons in my hands and in my feet would hurt and they would feel like they almost would catch at times you know I would go to reach for something and I'm like oh it's just a jolt you know it's it would feel like they were like rubbing over the top of each other as I would just a really weird sensation but it was obvious inflammation in my tendons I've had numbness and tingling in my hands and feet off and on for probably 20 years and actually I have a funny story I went I told my doctor about 10 years ago that my hands get numb a lot and especially if I raise them up above like you know maybe chest level even even to put them on the shopping cart they would be numb within a few minutes and she said well are they numb 24 7 or just off and on I'm like well it's off and on you know it's not not 24 7 and she said okay well tell me if it gets to be where they're numb 24 <laughs> 7 what <laughs> what did I hear you correctly ma'am did you just tell me that that I have to be completely numb 24 7 before you're gonna look into this any further Honey, that's, that's malpractice. I'm just going to say it right there. That's malpractice. So inappropriate. Okay, another symptom I had. This is number 12. Um, and this started after I started taking the uh, GERD medications. Prilosec was the one that I was taking when this actually started. But I would... The only way I can explain it is like whole body vibrations. I would lay down and I would feel like it was like a like a buzzing throughout my body. Just it felt like it was almost like a pulse, but it didn't go with my heart rate. So that was kind of weird. And I thought, is this MS? Is this I mean, this is a neurological symptom. I knew, you know, sometimes when you know when you have some medical knowledge and you try to put your stuff together and diagnose yourself, you can think a whole lot of things are wrong with you. Um, and I still, I don't know what caused that. Um, I quit taking that medication I, and I would still have it from time to time. So, um, And when I told the doctor about that one, I just got the look like, with all these symptoms, do we need to send you for a psyche valve? Like, that's how she looked at me. And I know, as a medical professional, I know what she's thinking. Because I've thought that stuff before. I hate to admit that. Um, you know, we would actually have people who would bring in this kind of thing. Bring in this kind of thing. Bring in their list of symptoms and they would really be thinking like I'm giving them every little bit of information so they can put that puzzle together they can figure this out I know they can they had faith in us and guess what guess what we did we let them down when they see these the, the list of symptoms the doctors don't think oh this person's really in touch with their body they think cuckoo cuckoo it's 
sad but true. Okay. Now, let's see here. Um, okay. Heart palpitations. Uh, A.K.A. In my case, these heart palpitations were PVCs. Premature ventricular contractions. Um, I know this because I would hook myself up to the monitor and see them. And I would have, I was getting to where I would have like 20 a minute. Way too many. Or, you know, 15 or 20 a minute. Way too many. Um, and then sometimes when I was laying down, I would feel like my heart was just pounding so hard in my chest that it would wake me up at night. Now that, I suspect, that was after I was on Adderall. And I suspect that that had something to do with the Adderall. But um, at times it was almost like I had never really had much anxiety. But this was like, it was almost like a panic attack. You know, I've kind of associated it with some panic and anxiety. Which who knows what caused what. Did the anxiety cause the palpitations and wake me up out of a dead sleep? Or did the palpitations make me extremely anxious when I woke up and felt like I was dying. Could have been either. Um, sinus pain and pressure. I always felt like my sinuses were just stopped up. They just, when I would lay down, I, you know, you feel that just roll from one side to the other. So I would lay down at night and I would just feel... You know, this is stopped up. Now it's open and drained. And then I'd go to the other side and it would drain to that side. Just freaking miserable. People don't realize how debilitating post-nasal drip can be. Sinus problems can just be absolute, just a huge pain in the ass. You know, it's, it's not like it, it's not like it's going to kill you. But it definitely stops you from having a normal life. Also, I had nasal polyps. I could look up there and with my flashlight and see. And just, just felt like I always had problems with sinuses. That is completely gone. And a lot of that, I think, was related to yeast as well. Because when I would take Diflucan, it would go away completely. However, when I would report this to my doctor that multiple times I've taken Diflucan, it's resolved, came back, take another Diflucan down the road, completely resolved the next day or that day. Oh, it's a coincidence. It's happened like 20 times, but it's a coincidence. Okay. And for the record, doctors are great. I work with them every day, okay? We've got some really, really great doctors out there. I work with a lot of surgeons, which I love. I mean, if you need surgery, you need surgery, you know? And, and when they fix you up, they, they do a great job, a lot of them. They're really good, but, you know, the gaslighting that I've experienced as a nurse going to my doctors and trying to get answers has been just like if I can't navigate the medical system as a nurse of 23 years what's the next person doing you know what's the what's the, the what's the layman doing here you know I swear I want to start my own business where I charge a fee to go to your doctor's appointment with you, to interpret everything they say to you, to ask appropriate questions, and then to advise you on what what your options are. I think that would be a, a terrific business for me to go into. Um, but yeah, so I work with doctors every day, and what it is, in my opinion, they're taught one thing in medical school, okay? They're not given a lot of nutrition training. They um, don't really have a lot of extra time to do a lot of extra research and read a lot of the studies. A lot has changed since most of them went to medical school. I think that most people who become doctors have great have the best intentions they're doing it for the right reason 
they want to help people, obviously. But I think that I think that the amount of studying that's necessary to really stay on top of things and the current science that's out there that's not something that the drug company's pushing on you because that's skewed. I think that there's there would have to be a paradigm shift for doctors to get on the same page with some of the science that we know is is available. Anyway, I think doctors have the best of intentions, the majority of them going to medicine for the right reason. However, there's a lot of information that they may not be able have a lot of time to study up on that's not commonly used in medicine and that is that nutrition namely a low carb or ketogenic diet can be used to treat a lot of conditions that that people have and you know that's that's not the paradigm that exists in the medical field. It's medications and it's surgery. You don't get a whole lot of root cause analysis. You know, what, what is causing your problem? You get a lot of symptom treatment and, you know, what medication can I prescribe for that? What tests can I run to detect that? But there's not a lot of, okay, why do you have GERD? You know, that's something that I have realized as I have met so many people that have been able to get rid of their GERD just by eating a proper diet or a proper human diet, as Dr. Barry says. Um, that's one thing I've realized is that if you have GERD, it's probably something you're eating. But I've literally never had a doctor tell me that. It's just, it's just, I know, I know, I know. Because when something happens to you, then you know it firsthand. And you don't need a doctor to tell you that that's the way it is because you know how it is because you experience it. But sometimes the medical field, we kind of poo-poo people's experiences too. And, you know, as they're rattling off all their symptoms, we're like, and I say we, the medical field in general is like, oh no, that's, that's not it. That's not, that couldn't be it. Well, it could be. You know, we're, we're all doing our, we're all doing our best here. Um, you know, I'm not trying to down my field, the medical field at all. Um, I just think that um, the people who make the guidelines that we go by, they are the ones that ultimately need to um, need to incorporate some of this stuff and need to get away from just constantly pushing pills at people. Um, but anyway, okay, so 15, constantly crave carbs and sugar my entire life. When I was young, I, I can remember just going for the sugar constantly. Like if I would have one cookie. I would want five. You know, there was a little bit of binging on on carbs. Not a little bit. It turned into a, a lot. I mean, not not a lot. It was just um, <laughs> I was one of those people that I was really selective about the stuff that I would eat, especially in the last few years. I didn't I didn't want to waste a good meal on food that wasn't worth eating, you know. When we would order from a restaurant at work, I would find the most tasty thing on that menu and I would order it. 
people wouldn't make comments. My coworkers would make comments about my food all the time. They would say, you always order the best stuff. Like, that looks so good. And then I would order something for lunch and something for dinner later. And then sometimes I might eat them both at the same time. <laughs> But the reason why is because I didn't want to take any chances with getting something crappy and just losing a whole good meal there, you know? <laughs> like, I just was like a connoisseur of food. Um, so, unable to lose weight pretty much since I was in my mid-30s, I've been... Other than keto, I lost 30 pounds on keto. And there was one time when I was on Topamax and I lost 30 pounds. <laughs> Topamax was for the migraines. Um, and the migraines were actually, the only symptom I had was double vision. So we're getting off on a tangent here. But, um, but yeah, so, but other than that, just pretty much the scale wouldn't move unless it was going up. Um, hard to even turn over in bed. I would wake up aching on my entire side that I was sleeping on so bad that sometimes I couldn't even hardly move myself over in the bed because it hurt so bad. That's not normal. If you, if you have this, it's not normal. And that's another thing that my family doctor would tell me. Um, oh, all these symptoms are because you have four kids. You're getting older. This is the way it is. No, that's not true. That's a lie. Um, so lately, pri right prior to starting carnivore, my upper arms would hurt so bad at night. Um, I don't know what that was from. I suspected that it might have been from metformin because I had been taking metformin that had been prescribed from my um, functional medicine doctor to try to prevent diabetes and also to try to help my candida out. Um, and, you know, I'd heard good things about metformin, so I agreed to take it. And um, it... It had a lot of negative side effects, as do most medications. But I suspect that the metformin was causing that upper arm pain. And actually, it wasn't just that pain at night. I was having pain in my arms almost all the time. Like, if I would raise up my arm, it would just feel like it really took a lot of, you know, oh, I've got to get over that pain and so I can raise my arm up. Definitely, if I, rose, if I would raise it up above my head, I mean, I almost couldn't. And now I'm just like, I'm just moving my arms around everywhere. It doesn't hurt at all. Um, it's That's completely resolved as well. Um, oh, one of the most embarrassing things. I would get so out of breath walking and talking. I would be walking in the hospital with one of my coworkers. And I would just get so out of breath. I, it would be embarrassing if I would, I mean, Lord, forget trying to go upstairs. If I, if I went up one flight of stairs by the time I got to the top, I would be so out of breath that I would be embarrassed. Low libido. And some of that also, I believe, was due to taking Adderall. Adderall can decrease your interest. And I think it did that for me just made me kind of numb. Made me like, oh, I'm focused, I'm focused, but was I really? No. And also, I would forget all kinds of things on the Adderall. It would make me so focused on what I was doing right that minute, but then I had no foresight whatsoever. Like, I couldn't plan for anything. Two or three days would go by, and I'd be like, oh, yeah. Oh, we're in the next week now. You know, the time just, it really messed, it really messed me up. Um, things that I really enjoyed before, like I've always made a lot of lists. And over the years, I have developed ways of 
dealing with my ADHD. Um, you know, I have I had ADHD for 40, 42 years before I was ever diagnosed. So I have 42 years of experience with dealing with ADHD and knowing what I needed to do to help myself remember what I needed to remember or, you know, what kind of, I had my systems in order. Okay. I knew how to, I knew how to live my life and to, and to succeed in life with my ADHD. You know, I knew that I didn't learn like everyone else did. Um, videos worked better for me. I knew that I um, couldn't pay attention as well, so I would record my classes and then go home and type them out or write them out. Um, just many different things that I would do to um, overcome my ADHD symptoms. My overall mood was just lower, even though I have always been a fairly happy person. It's hard to be happy when you're that tired. I mean, when you're, when you're so fatigued that by the end, of, by three o'clock, you're just so drained and any little thing feels like it just takes a huge amount of effort to do. You can barely even feed your kids because you're just so exhausted. And then they would always have activities at six o'clock, you know, oh, we have to go to Cub Scouts at six o'clock. Oh dear, I have to drink my energy drink and then I have to, you know, take an Adderall and you know, it's just you don't want to you don't want to have to live like that. It's it's so bad. I would have to take a nap before I could go to anything at six o'clock. Um, and then all the other adults seem to be totally fine to be there at six p.m., which I would be now. You know, hell, I'm not even. I barely want to sleep as it is <laughs> on carnivore I, I don't need a lot of sleep I, you know I've always been that person that I could sleep anywhere anytime I'd go to bed my head would hit the pillow and I'd be immediately asleep with carnivore I don't have insomnia but I probably have more of like a normal sleep pattern and so it's weird for me because I'll lay there for a few minutes and I'm like I'm not going to sleep <laughs> and it's not like it's taken me a long time it's just I'm so used to just hitting the pillow and just being out done you know so I touched on the memory problems more forgetful than usual um, I had to carefully choose what to concentrate on um, to basically I had like a file system in my brain where if someone would tell me something even though it might be important to them if it wasn't something that I really needed to know and retain, I would put it in file 13 because I didn't have that mental space for their problem or their whatever they were trying to tell me. Um, it was getting really scary because I wouldn't remember and then when somebody reminded me, I would have no recollection whatsoever like they couldn't remind me and that was scary um, I started to think am I getting Alzheimer's or you know what's going on here now some of that could be some premenopausal stuff don't like to think about that but it's a possibility you know I have heard that a lot of times women who are premenopausal um, start to think that they're crazy, you know, start to think, oh gosh, I, have, I don't remember that at all. <laughs> one thing was one of my friends had told me um, that she had, she thought she had a GI bleed and you would think that I would remember that. And then she told me that, she told me uh you know that she was okay and and that everything had resolved and that was about a month later and I didn't remember even hearing that story that was I I was telling her no you didn't tell me that story you didn't tell me that you didn't tell me that I I really think she told me that I just I didn't remember at all oh okay so here's another one of those symptoms that 
to me seemed like almost autoimmune in nature. Um, after I would eat, and it was different things, it wasn't always, you know, it could be something really simple, just, just plain meat, or it could be, you know, just a regular meal. After I would eat almost every single time, my nose and my palms of my hands would turn bright red. I have pictures and sometimes they still do, but it's gotten a lot less. And trying to research the cause of that, the red palms could possibly be due to um, RA. So I suspected that could be, it could be a uh, autoimmune symptom. Uh, shortness of breath at times would feel kind of wheezy, but no asthma, especially after I would eat certain things. I would just get really mucusy, and I've discovered that almonds, I believe, well, nuts, I ate some mixed nuts. I think it was the almonds, though, that made me feel that way recently. A burning sensation down my trachea and esophagus for years. Um, I'm not sure if that was related to GERD or not, but it felt inflamed. And I can't tell you the number of times that I've told my doctor, I feel inflamed. This feels inflamed. That feels inflamed. Just have a general inflamed feeling, okay? That never triggered anything for them. They've literally... My doc, my prior doctor has literally never asked me what I was eating, you know. Um, I don't know. I, I can't, I can't speak for her, but she's, yeah, she's no longer my doctor. I have a, I have a, another doctor now, um. And I really liked the whole doctor. I really did. I saw her for like 15 years. I mean, I enjoyed talking to her. You know, but she was not in great health herself. I mean, you could just look at her and tell that she thought that having kids was that you were supposed to be, you were supposed to have some issues after that. She was very inflamed herself. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if that was GERD or possibly reactive airway as they, they said I didn't have asthma. I went for pulmonary function tests and they said I didn't have asthma. So they called it, you know, reactive airway. So it's like, kind of like asthma that comes and goes essentially, <laughs> depending on, you know, it can be related to exercise or something you eat or, you know, whatever. Basically... It was inflammation. It's just inflammation. It's all, most things I feel like are related to inflammation, you know. Um, I mean, I'm no doctor, but I know what I see and I know what I feel. And I feel like I could write a book on it. Oh, yeah. And another thing that she offered me when I told her how inflamed I was and told her of all my symptoms. Um, I was offered more meds, or also she tried to give me a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. We might want to consider that you may have fibromyalgia. No, thank you. No, ma'am. No. I'm not going to say that fibromyalgia doesn't exist. The symptoms are definitely real. These poor people are definitely suffering. But fibromyalgia is a diagnosis of exclusion. Okay, you've excluded everything else. What are we left with? Oh, we got this mystery illness over here, fibromyalgia, that we really don't know much about. Don't really know what causes it. Um, you know, we kind of put a few things together over the years and here you go. Serve it up on a platter. You got fibromyalgia. No, you're not doing that to me. Because you know what happens is 
when you get that diagnosis and then, you know, they start to, there are a lot of people in the medical field who will see that diagnosis and they will make assumptions about you. And that's all I'm going to say about that. You know, they, they will make assumptions that, you know, you're one of those people that brings in the list. You know, you got a lot of crazy going on here, all right? None of this could possibly be real. It's a lot of crazy going on, okay? You got the fibromyalgia on there. No, not doing that to me. And in case I didn't clarify clearly enough, I absolutely 100% know that fibromyalgia patients are experiencing a real sickness, okay? So don't get it twisted. This is, it's, it's a real thing, okay? Um, I just don't think that it's what they're calling it. I think that it's, I think that it's basically um, due to inflammation, you know, not necessarily inflammation that you're going to pick up on um, all your blood tests that you get, but we all know that you can be inflamed, you know, inflammation's good, your body, it, it's good up to a certain point, you know, you need that inflammation to respond to things that attack your body, viruses, bacteria, you know, it's good, okay, until it's not. And I think most diseases are chronic inflammation and they're just presenting in different areas of your body. That's my opinion, okay? This is not anything that anybody in the medical field has taught me, so my opinion um, oh IBS symptoms gassy bloating every single time I would eat any carbs whatsoever whether just salads or bread I would get very bloated and I'm talking bloated like up at like right the top of my abdomen, bloated like at the top of my abdomen, where, you know, like where my actual stomach was. Um, just, um, so gassy, <laughs> so gassy. If I would eat any wheat at all, um, yeah, it, it was, it was bad. Now, on the carnivore diet, guess what I don't have, like at all. <laughs> no gas, none at all. Oh, something else crazy that happened on carnivore. So when I went on vacation, I actually drank a little bit and I had some vodka and I put some electrolytes in it. Um, because, you know, I thought maybe that might make the next day not so bad. Um, well, the bad news <laughs> is that uh, the next day was awful. Um, I felt horrible. I don't want to do that again, right? But um, the crazy thing was, is I was always a really, somebody that was really quick to, you know, get drunk. <laughs> I mean, I could have like a couple, three drinks and I'd be, you know, I had two or three shots of vodka would have put me totally out before I didn't even feel buzzed at all like it wasn't even a good feeling so I, I think there's something there with carnivore I don't I don't think carnivores get drunk <laughs> I'm sure that's not true but it's you know and and possibly you know, where I had the candida before, that could have been possibly, uh, I was just constantly fermenting so much sugar in my intestines that when then, then when I added the alcohol in there, then it really, 
made me drunk, you know. Some people can get drunk just on uh, fermentation and, <laughs> you know, diabetics can get drunk. Um, anyway, we won't go into all that, but... Um, Double vision, migraines, blurry vision, worsening vision. Uh, my vision used to be 2020, and it was 2020 until I was probably like 30 years old. And then uh, all of a sudden, my vision wasn't great anymore. It was just really blurry. And I mean, that could have just been something that would have happened anyway. But the double vision, it started during a really stressful period in my life. Uh, my dad was diagnosed with ALS, and he lived for three years with that, with ALS, and he died in 2012, and when he, shortly after he was diagnosed, I was standing at work, I'll never forget, I had just emptied a Foley catheter, I stood up, looked across the unit, and all of a sudden I saw two of everything. It felt like I was like crossing my eyes. Like felt like my eyes were just crossing when I didn't want them to. And I shook my head and then I covered up one eye and I could see clearly. And to make a long story short, it took over a year to get a diagnosis. I finally had to go see a neuro ophthalmologist and he diagnosed me with migraines. Um, ask him were they optical migraines he said no but basically that was my migraine was the double vision occasionally i would have headaches with it but it wasn't a migraine type headache it was more just a regular headache so i mean the topamax helped it however the topamax made me dumb as a rock um, totally forget things it made me flip words that or, or flip things that i would say and I would think they came out the way they were supposed to come out, but they came out just like flipped around. So like I would give the doctor results of, you know, the patient's hemoglobin and hematocrit were blah, 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 blah. Only in my mind, I thought I said it correctly, but I said it backwards. You know, I, I gave the number for the hematocrit with the hemoglobin and vice versa. So that was, that was a mess. Um, so, basically what I discovered with the migraines was how I could help prevent those um, was also with what I ate. If I ate a lot of sugar, it definitely triggered it. The worst one I ever had, I was laying on the couch after work and I ate almost a whole bag of M&M's. I'm talking about it like a big family size bag of peanut M&M's. Um, I got such severe vertigo and with the double vision that if I would move my shoulder over just an inch, it would just feel like it was, I mean, the whole room was just spinning. That night I actually thought I was having a stroke and we, and I ended up taking a ride in the ambulance to my own hospital. So yeah, it was nice to finally go ahead and get that diagnosis and the Topamax did help it. But, like I said, I had to get off it because it just, Topamax is a very harsh drug. It causes a lot of bad symptoms, and if you don't absolutely have to have it, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, did lose 30 pounds, though, because it completely took my appetite away. However, that was not, that was not a good reason for continuing to take it, so I eventually weaned myself off of it. Um, and, you know, like I said, I controlled the migraines with, um, eating, trying to eat better. And, um, when I would have them, it was, you know, maybe once or twice a month and it wasn't every day as it had been in the past. Okay, guys, my phone went dead. So I'm going to have to pretty quickly wrap this up. It's getting really late. Um, but I'm just going to kind of read over some stuff that I had written down. I could never just get up and go in the morning. Now if I wake up, I have to get up because my legs have so much just energy. It almost feels like I have restless leg. I'm just turning, tossing and turning in bed because I have so much energy, uh, which is a great thing. 
and in the past I had hot flashes really bad after carbs um, early in the pandemic probably due to stress I was having really bad hot flashes and I thought that I was going into menopause which I quit I cut the carbs out and they totally went away so um, acne candida rash versus wheat rash on my face and neck so like all along my jawline and then down here I would just have this just really itchy rash after I would eat wheat um, and or sometimes sugar and let's see saw every doctor known to man functional medicine doctor of course my primary care doctor functional medicine doctor rheumatologist immunologist neuro ophthalmologist chiropractor massage therapist monthly as a matter of fact i'm going tomorrow because in the past if i didn't go to the massage therapist i didn't function i wasn't able to move you know and i have to be able to move to take care of other people um my legs in the last probably six months my legs when i would sit on the toilet and i wouldn't even be there for a long time i'm not a long toilet sitter but sitting on the toilet my toes would look would have like a purplish tinge to them that tells me that my circulation was not great in my legs and they would go numb and sometimes at work they would go numb just me sitting at the desk and I would have to stand up and, you know, stomp around and stuff to get them to come back. Don't have that anymore. Go, yay, so, carnivore. You know, people ask me why I'm doing carnivore. This is why. This, all of this stuff, every single one of these symptoms that I've told you about is all but gone. Okay. I do occasionally have some stiffness when I stand up, when I've been sitting for too long. Um... My right knee, I never really noticed it before, but I guess that's because I was just aching all over. And this is just barely aching. But it feels like um, my joint in my right knee is a little bit, a little bit swollen. And when I sit, you know, um, with my leg up, like bent up, it, uh, it will kind of ache a little bit. It's nothing major. But essentially, most of these symptoms are completely gone. And so, I just can't sing carnivore's praises enough. I mean, it's... I want to tell everybody about it, but nobody wants to hear about it. So, that's why I'm telling you guys. Because if you're here, you must want to hear about it. Okay, so I'm just going to run down some symptoms I had in my phone from 2017. And this was stuff that happened off and on throughout the years. It just started back then. Um, red face, hot face and ears, uh, swollen face and eyes when I would wake up. Um, my eyes would be kind of like bloodshot, just kind of dry and, and painful. Um, I would get these little blisters like right on my eyelid. Like they weren't styes. They were actual little fluid-filled blisters, and I could scrape my finger across them and bust them. If I didn't, they would just feel like, they may feel like something was in my eye the whole time. So I would have to just scrape my finger across them and um, bust them. I'd wash my hands first to make sure they were clean. Um, but yeah, that was very uncomfortable. And I think that was just like an inflammation. I mean... Y'all, chalk it up to inflammation, okay? Inflammation is 99% of my problem. Um, inappropriate inflammation, by the way. Uh, okay, hot, hot breath feeling, um, flu-like symptoms. And, and the hot breath feeling, I've always explained as, if you've ever had a fever, which I really don't get many of those. And I think that's due to my immune deficiency. That's just something that I've put together, but I've always known my whole life that I really hardly ever get fevers, you know? 
Um, other people would get really high fevers and I might get a little tiny fever, but it wasn't anything compared to everybody else's. And I would rarely, rarely get them, even when I had the full on flu. Um, but yeah, hot breath feeling, I explain as the times that I have had fevers, you know, they were probably never above 102. Um, but you just get, you just know that you have a fever. Like you don't even have to take your temperature. You just feel that hot breath. It, <laughs> it's hot breath feeling. I don't know. Um, so my body would just feel inflamed. Um, loss of appetite, not much interest in food at times, sleeping up to 18 hours a day, rash. I had various rashes on my abdomen arms, legs, not terribly itchy. It was just there. Um, body aches. Um, at that time I was taking Crestor, Zoloft, Wellbutrin, and Prilosec. Now, I pretty much got all of, off of all those except for Wellbutrin. I still, the only medication I take now is Wellbutrin and vitamin D. So, um, diarrhea off and on. Um, never really had much constipation. It was mostly just off and on diarrhea. And, and I've had that pretty much my whole life. Like I would eat something and before we would leave, usually out at a restaurant, before we would leave the restaurant, I would have to go to the bathroom. So that was fun. Um, oh, aching elbows. Like my elbows would ache all the time. And I was really kind of worried about that because my dad told me when he was still alive, he told me that one of his uh, only symptoms of his, he had three blockages in his heart. He ended up having to have open heart surgery and um, his, even his widow maker was like 90, I think they said 95% occluded. Um, but one of his only symptoms was elbow pain. And after he had the cabbage, the open heart surgery, the elbow pain resolved. So that was really concerning to me, but I'd had elbow, aching elbows for a while. Um, aching knees, fingers, fatigue, um, Itchy hands and feet. Oh my, that's inflammation, y'all. Itchy hands and feet. The soles of my feet would itch so bad. And they would get like hot and feel like they were swollen. And that was one of the symptoms I would have after I would eat, you know, particularly wheat. Um, I remember once I went on this um, Advocare diet and I took all their supplements and did all the stuff. And the supplements basically caused a bunch of diarrhea. Um, you know, of course I lost some weight there, but um, you know, it wasn't, wasn't a great diet plan for me. Um, but I remember at the end where I had gone back to eating regular food, I decided I was gonna have a big plate of spaghetti and I was gonna have some garlic bread that was actually made out of some cheap hot dog buns that I had put in the toaster and uh, buttered and, and put some garlic on. And oh my gosh, after I did that, I was immediately just stopped up. Nose was terribly stopped up. Um, and then my hands, the palms of my hands and the soles of my feet were red, swollen and itchy inflammation y'all um so you know i told you about the coughing it was a horribly dry just itchy throat feeling um my legs i told you i had some leg numbness um extreme fatigue muscle soreness charlie horses uh feeling like my blood sugar was low all the time even after eating, that was a really weird feeling. I'm not sure what caused that. Um,
muscle aches. Um, oh, and a really weird symptom. And this is probably going to be the last one. I'm sure it's not the only one. <laughs> but it's going to be the last that I tell you all about tonight. Um, and it, I remember this first happened when I was pregnant. And I actually talked to a PA at work and she had the same symptoms. And we determined that we thought it was some sort of vitamin deficiency. Never did really figure out which one it would be, but... Um, but that was our, our best guess. And it was, it felt like a stinging, like it felt like stinging and like little, like, like something was biting you all over. And it was just like, you feel a sting and kind of press on it and it scratch it a little bit and just, just, you know, just really, um, uncomfortable. And then you'd feel a few minutes later, you'd feel another little sting the best I can describe it would be, um, maybe like getting bit by a little ant or a, or maybe getting bit by like a sweat bee or something, you know, it wasn't horrible, but it was enough to where you knew it was there. And then you'd look and there's nothing there. So that was weird. But yeah, um... And this is a lot, you know. Um, it was hard to even remember to write that list. It was hard to even remember all the symptoms. Over the years, I had put a lot in my phone from just various trips to the doctor because I have learned that if I go in the doctor's office, I'm not going to remember everything to tell them, first of all. Uh, secondly, they're telling me stuff, I'm telling them stuff, and then they'll leave the room, and I'm like, oh, wait, I forgot to tell them the most important part, so I like to collect my thoughts, get them in my phone, and so I had that data there, you know, I had that information there that I could just basically put in a, um, that I could just basically print off and read it to you guys, but, um, but yeah, so if I were if I were asked what my very worst symptoms were and what made me start the carnivore diet, it was definitely candida, the chronic candida. And I read a study that uh, where a girl had gotten rid of her chronic candida. She she basically cured herself of chronic candida with the carnivore diet. So that's the only reason why I even. Pretended to, <laughs> why, while I, why I ever started the carnivore diet was because of that. Now, I had every intention of, of, after about 30 days or 60 days, going back to, or going to keto. Um, at this point, I really haven't had much desire to do so. Because I felt so good. So, we'll see how it goes. Um, I may... I may transition to a ketovore, um, but we'll see, you know, we'll see how it goes and I will try to keep you guys updated. I'm sure for some people, this is going to be the most boring thing ever, but I felt like I needed to get my symptoms out there so that you would understand just how much was going on. And I was still a fully functioning person who was going to work every day. Well, not every day, but several times a week. And taking care of everything that needed to be taken care of. And I wasn't down for any amount of time. It was just miserable. Just miserable every day. And now, I'm not. Now I have limitless energy. I mean, the energy that I have is just like, wow, through the roof. Um, I don't ever have headaches anymore. I used to literally have headaches every single day. I don't, um, have any post nasal trip or sinus problems at all. Okay. None. Um, Aches and pains are very, very few and far between. 
uh, just recently went on a trip to Florida and before I would be aching so bad in my hips by the time we got there that, well, first of all, I would have had to stop halfway because I wouldn't have been able to do 10 hours like that. This time I did 10 hours. I was barely even stiff when I got out of the car at the end of the 10 hours. So just so much has changed for me. I've lost, like I said, 18 pounds and I probably have about 30 more to go. So I will definitely keep you guys updated and thanks for uh, chatting with me this evening or this morning. <laughs> and I think I better go to bed now because I think it's pretty close to 4 a.m. if not past it. So I'll talk to you later. Bye.